Hmm. No, lots to unpack there. I think when you said work on your strengths, uh, I definitely hear that a lot. Uh, and it makes me wonder the people that say work on your strengths and really forget about your weaknesses. Um, I think that that is very true. Um, definitely if you want to, uh, in, a, in a world where they really do value like one sort of skill trade or like a specialist sort of uh, world, you're not really paid for in this world to be a generalist. You're paid to be a specialist. Mm -hmm. So that definitely does resonate. And your second point about uh, going along the path that is already taken for success, I think it does work for a lot of people, but maybe that person is not you. Obviously, they're not you. So you should also then look at other paths or try to create or take different paths that people have taken and put it along so that you can take that path that is more suited to, to you. Uh, mm. I, I find that clerkships are interesting. Uh, I spoke to another law student and that's just a, apparently the way that you can actually get into corporate law or the, or the most typical or the common way. And mm. that's what is defined as success, which is really interesting to me because I study commerce as well as arts. Mm. Um, and the typical way would be to get into the big four, big four auditing companies. Yeah. Uh, so no, definitely the strengths point is really interesting, but also the path that has already been taken for success mm. in, in a world where there's so much more choice, a lot more flexibility and, and entrepreneurship has really th thrived because uh, these paths that haven't been taken, people are, that are willing to take and willing to risk uh, taking these un un untaken paths. So mm. yeah, what, what are your thoughts on that? Yeah, I think, I think that's a good point. I think what I would add is that there's, I think there's even more nuance to it. So mm. even in terms of understanding the strength, um, to, to, for example, one of my weaknesses is maths. I'm really not good at maths. <laughs> it's something I'm not great at and something I want to improve because I know that if I got into politics in the future or wherever I may, may go, it's yeah. also important to understand that. And um, I think that's an important lesson in humility in the sense that I know I'm not going to be great. And I know I'm not going to be as good as I'm sure you are or another commerce student or that kind of thing. Um, but the, I guess the courage to ask others for help. And if it's not my strength to be able to, to, to use people and create a, a network that I can bring people in, if I'm solving issues and solving problems, to, to use our combined strengths mm. to create something better than, than trying to do everything by myself. So I guess that's what I mean about strength, but absolutely, like there is still power in working on your weaknesses, which mm. I, is a goal of mine as well. Um, but when it comes to your second point about that lack of, sorry, the idea of conventional success, mm. it's very interesting because in a way I think I have embodied conventional success as in I'm studying at ANU, which is, you know, one of the top law schools in Australia. And I think about where I want to go after this, which might be postgrad at, you know, Oxford or something like that. Mm. These are all very conventional modes of success. But, and I think there's nothing wrong with that. It's just the end picture. And it is what do you want to achieve with this conventional kind of success immediately? Yeah. So, for example, you know, the reason why I study law and the reason why I want to go to Oxford and, you know, study there in those spaces is to get the, the tools and the um, support and the knowledge that if I come back, you know, and I work in government and politics, I'm so much better equipped to, you know, be able to address various issues. But... In, I think that's the difference because if I was just going into a place like Oxford, for example, just to have the name, just to have it on the resume, um, that doesn't give me a course to morally guide where I want to where I want to end up being. Yep. So there's nothing wrong with you know doing working in a prestigious law firm or the top four. Um, mm. In fact, absolutely, I would encourage it. Mm. But just real, just think about why. And I think if you can think about that why and really internally hold the mirror to yourself. And think about the long-term journey in the vision. That is the most important part because I think if you can think about the very long-term, even not even the job, but the purpose towards what you can see in the future, that can map your course for where you end up being. And I think that the shame about I think a lot of people, um, sorry, a lot of um, things like this is that if you don't think critically about it, it's easy to get swept up in what other people say. But the most important thing I think one can do for themselves is to understand their own personal experience above what anyone else will tell them. And that's been something that I think I've really worked on this year compared to other years. Definitely. And the COVID um, time alone to yourself def definitely helps that a blessing in disguise. <laughs> it, does, it does. It really has for me. Yeah. Yeah. No, that's, that's an actually very interesting point. I think also because... Uh, 
you're also very um, obviously knowledgeable and skilled and I'm very passionate about uh, the, the space of um, women's rights and the social impact issues. But with the person that, let's say, has gone down a much more conventional route and doesn't have a very clear overarching or bigger purpose uh, mm -hmm. that really is guiding them or where they can see, um, and they're all just, I guess, restricted towards a much more short-term or medium-term sort of goal, mm -hmm. and then working towards uh, maybe adapting and working as things come to them. Mm -hmm. uh, what would you then say to, I guess, a lot of a lot of students who sort of grapple with that and have like basically a quarter-life crisis? Mm -hmm. uh, shout out to one of my friends who actually has a podcast named Quarter Life Crisis. But okay. a lot of people who actually don't have those a purpose uh, yeah. greater than that. And then, what would you say to that? Yeah, um, I think there is nothing, there should be no stigma around quarter life crises because I think, I think what a quarter life crisis really represents <laughs> is the uncertainty that young people face every single day. We live in a very uncertain world. The workforce is uncertain, politics is uncertain, climate is uncertain. There is so much going on and there's so much noise that I don't blame anyone. And in fact, I've experienced this. It's hard to, to, to it's, with all the noise going on, it's hard to kind of find clarity um, but the way that at least thing that I would use is yeah. to, to to understand yourself because again it's not finding the job it's to understand yourself first the way that I've done it is that I think about the key and crucial and formative moments of my life and I can point to many for example I always talk about this you know I did a year 10 public speaking speech about my mother and Islamophobia and her experience and it is those experiences that that resonate with me the most in terms of my own formative experience. Mm. So what I would recommend to others is to think about what really shaped you and what really resonated with you through those experiences. And it doesn't mean that everyone has to go on to, you know, work in an NGO. That's not, not even that. It could be, I mean, you know, there are many working even in the startup scene that have had yeah. to do similar processes and probably have this feeling of, frustration that God we need to do so much more to prepare Australia and the wider society for for an uncertain future mm. there is so much that could be taken in so many different directions but the, the most important part almost is creating a timeline of your own life and to really sit and reflect on that instead of being caught up in the next thing because it's so easy to want to graduate uni or high school or find the job and then you think about it but what I always say is that you can start now. You really can. Um, you know, just as you've started this podcast, you can just start now. And that leads to an amazing, it's kind of like a snowball effect. Once you get the ball rolling yep. and you start talking to people and even, you know, I think even there's merit in that talking to others and hearing and listening to them and listening to their own stories and, and kind of just taking that to, to internally reflect is that's just as important as any internship or any, any mentorship or anything else. I definitely agree. I, mm -hmm. I I felt like I've had that moment, and it was just by coincidence. But I the first time I went overseas, it was to Jakarta, Indonesia, mm -hmm. and I in a country that is I guess a little bit less uh, I guess modernized than Australia, um, had so much uh, I guess influence or I was so much so impacted by the role of technology, mm -hmm. and there's this app called Gojek that is just runs basically the whole uh, city basically in a very incredible way uh, where you can just ride, you can just order food, you can get your house cleaned up through that app. And yeah, that just got me thinking because uh, I, I do have, uh, I've grown up with my grandparents ever since I was young mm -hmm. and that's so, sort of something ingrained in my culture and in, in my family that you take care of your grandparents and your parents mm -hmm. until uh, they're old. Uh, so I was just thinking, and because I lived across from uh, my neighborhood, um, from my neighbors uh, mm -hmm. who uh, unfortunately don't, don't have their kids to actually look after them. And that just got me thinking. So, and I just sort of put all of these parts and all of these experiences together. And that was sort of actually one of my stories or one of my motivations when I did um, speak at the new Columbia plant interview. And that was, oh. I wanted to find a solution where when I'm gray and old, uh, mm -hmm. is there a better way to live or a better way? Like once you're after 70, it's not like your life is over. It's, there's something else to look forward to. Mm -hmm. So that's, that's what I sort of spoke about. And that's sort of the purpose in this context mm -hmm. uh, that I really, uh, really found. 
That's awesome. I think I think that is that is such a good example because I always think everyone has a story. Even if you don't think you have a story, mm. everyone has had formative moments of their life. Um, whether it be small or, or big, there is always something that is, has shaped you uniquely in a way that others have not experienced. And there is so much value in that uniqueness. There really is versus <laughs> trying to conform to, to something else. And mm. even with that app, like I think about my experiences as half Singaporean, right? Like you go to Singapore and there's the smart cities and so much more innovation that I look back in Australia and I go, what are we doing? Like, you look at like, you know, I grew up in the Gold Coast. We look at the bus system even and be like, this is so inefficient. There's yeah. so much better ways of doing things. Yeah. So to use that unique insight to think about, even think about that in my mind, that's something that I'm definitely interested in, in mm -hmm. the future. So definitely, um, I guess, awareness about those experiences is, is important. And I think that's the value of NCP, right? Because you can also <laughs> you know, go overseas and, and think about these things and, and come to new conclusions as well. So, yeah. Definitely. Definitely. And yeah, the Nuclear Mobile Plan just opens up a lot of avenues, as I've seen with alumni that have come back from the scholarship, yeah. all the experiences and the insights that they've learned. Um, it's really incredible. Um, and I think it was a point that we spoke about before this. It was about, well, I guess, looking back, how careers are quite uh, different now compared to in the past. Before it was more so, uh, well, actually, I I like to preface this in Japan, let's say you would actually stay with a company uh, for the most case for all, the most part of your life. Uh, but let's say in Australia, for example, um, staying with one company, doing the same thing every day for multiple years is, is quite rare now. Um, mm. what, what, what are your thoughts on that? Is that something that is um, a positive change or is that something that uh, we have to adapt to and is actually bringing some, a bigger challenge that we haven't actually thought about? Um, mm. since that wave of change mm. it's a positive change 100 yeah. percent, because the way that humans are is that we are complex creatures and i think the idea of staying in one organization for me at least would not be that's not even been how i've been going about my current path it's been so like this mm. but so much education within that experience to to help me create impact in wherever i end up going mm. but as positive as that is there is a negative in that our current education system is fundamentally unequipped to deal with this change because the way that the education system still is, this isn't uni, this is high school, um, is to get the grade and find the job. That is essentially the main focus. It's to get the ATAR or the OP or whatever mm -hmm. and to get into the degree and, and, and so forth and so on. Mm. But there is so much value in teaching the flexible skills, that kind of interpersonal skills, the critical thinking or the, the, the problem solving and entrepreneurship even. I mean, I think that entrepreneurship should be an actual subject, you know, in, across high schools. That there's so much, because to me, right, like, let me give you an example. Like, um, in civics class, I, I remember I did an interview with ABC about this. Um, young people were doing, the, I think it was a Victorian result, and they were doing pretty poorly. Like a lot of people failed or something like that. Mm. And they were saying, you know, why are young people failing civics? Well, I'll tell you why. Because you're giving young people information and you're making them rote learn what politics is, how many speakers, sorry, how many, what, you know, how many people are there in the House of Representatives versus the Senate, um, X, Y, Z. Mm. That's fine. But the question should be, what do you want, what do you think Australia needs to change? Or how do you create change within politics? How, you know, focusing on a certain cause and focusing on what they are passionate about. And that teaches so much more interpersonal skills than rote learning, so much more. And there's so much we can do to empower young people within high school to go out and forge their own path. But of course, people think about conventional success because that's what we've been taught our entire life in high school. And if we don't facilitate that innovative thinking, then how do we adapt for a future of work that is so very you know, multi-layered and, and complex and confusing? Um, so yeah, I think I think it's a good and positive thing that we're having a lot of different ideas and you know rotating between different kinds of spaces. That's how we create good solutions. But yep. in terms of how we're actually equipping our young people, I think it's so much more work to go. So much more work to go. I think I think rote learning is um is still an unfortunate problem. I think that's ingrained within the education mentality. I think we need a like systematic overhaul of what we view education to be. So yeah. 
Yeah. <laughs> Definitely a big topic. Huge <laughs> topic. <laughs> yeah. Uh, for remote learning, that just, I guess it reminds me of uh, some courses or sometimes um, in the past when I was at university where it was more so about learning and memorizing the content and then I guess applying that in, in some way of like how you understand the content. Um, mm-hmm. obvi- but there are obviously some courses that have just been amazing and um, has really encouraged me to really adapt and really problem solve, which I really appreciate. But from your knowledge and from your experience, has there, any, has there been any education system in the world or country that has really done a, a better job actually educating younger people um, mm. in this for, for like a, a future world? Um, essentially that's an interesting question and i think um i i, th- I would mean i would imagine it would be the, the obvious sense we scandinavian countries because obviously mm. the way that they go about education is is far less about necessarily the grade versus the actual um um like horizontal kind of thinking skills or being able to fluctuate between that so i, I would say probably that um but I think, I think I've reflected less on other countries and more kind of on my own experiences and as a high school student, what I would have wanted to see. Yeah. And what I talk about often is that, you know, when I graduated high school, I never knew about mentorship. I never knew about that navigating that space. I, it's because I took a gap year that I figured all of that out. But imagine in high school, and this is, you know, maybe this is already in private schools that are relatively wealthier, they have these initiatives. Yeah. But across the board, to have young people connecting with people in the industry, to be using their youth and risk-taking and insight and curiosity to address current problems that already exist. Because what I emphasise is that young people can have so much value in this conversation. They, they, they're there to learn, but they can also use their, li- their lived experience and their open-mindedness to inform better policy. And that's something that I've witnessed constantly through working with young people, especially around you know, mental health and, and their thoughts on education and all of this. Mm. So I guess I've less, I looked less towards a country model and more about the need to, to meaningfully engage with young people throughout this entire process because young people are stakeholders in education. They're not just passive chess pieces. They have so much to give and so much to say. So I think that's more been my, my focus. But, um, yeah, so I suppose my answer to that would be probably Scandinavian <laughs> countries, but yeah. I've thought less about it, actually. Mm. <laughs> Definitely. Yeah. <laughs> and... I guess moving on to another topic that you are very passionate about, um, I guess women, the workforce and just feminism in general as well. Uh, I'm not so, I guess, um, read up on that topic and just for a lot of people that are out there, is there any, I guess, issues or just something that is not, um, I guess, in the mainstream that is actually overlooked a lot, but should be a lot more important and prioritized in that space from your, yeah. uh, from your knowledge? Well, I guess what I've been talking about particularly is I've been using COVID-19 as an example Mm. of um, inequalities that have always existed, but have been amplified. And when we think about economics, it's easy to think about a broad brush economic policy, but it's really important to question who is affected within this current policy and whose voices aren't being heard in this space. And using COVID-19 as an example, you know, we've seen stimulus packages and we've seen welfare provided um, to Australians. But, for example, just as an example with JobKeeper, it's only for people that have worked consistently for 12 months, which means it's affecting casual workers. Let's look within that. Women represent the majority of casual workers. Let's look further within that. The majority of casual sectors are women-dominated, retail, hospitality, um, you know, accommodation, these are, these are industries disproportionately affected by COVID-19. Let's look further within that. Women have the higher burden of care compared to men and perform almost double the amount of time at home taking care of children, which means that there's even less likelihood that, you know, that, that explains, I guess, that why women are predominantly working in casual work because they are the ones expected to, you know, operate within the home and take on the family responsibilities. So there's this whole multi-tiered effect of the way that the economy affects women. Yet when we look at these policies on its front, you look closer and you realise, wait, women are disproportionately affected from this crisis. Um, Even in the healthcare industries or in the care industries, you know, you've seen the outbreaks in aged care and in hospitals. These are particularly women. And yet we haven't seen pay rises. We've seen, in fact, the care industry is one of the lowest paid in Australia. So across the board, women are being directly affected, but we're not seeing any 
any gendered kind of policies around this space. We're not seeing any gendered thinking. And I think that also reflects in, at least federally, the decision makers talking about this stuff. They're not women. We're not seeing women at the forefront leading this, this crisis. Um, and, you know, not getting, I guess, not only just women, but like feminist gendered thinking, which is, it's so easy to view feminism as like a marginal kind of on the peripheral thing and just kind of tick the box, mm -hmm. but it should be at the center of every policy we do because if we don't, it's only going to harm women. And if we don't talk about the burden of care, it will harm women. If we don't talk about the lack of valuing women's work, it will harm women. It, it's this flow and effect. So um, by not talking about it doesn't mean the problems aren't there. It just means we're doing a disservice to 51% of the population which is women. So, yeah, it's definitely a, a broader effect for people. You know, I guess unless you talk about it, it's, it's easy to miss, I guess. Your point about the burden of care reminds me of an article that I read about a minister in Japan that is, or well, in Japan it's predominantly very much uh, seen as, uh, um, I guess, the opportunities for women in Japan are a little bit less equal uh, mm. than, than for men. And one of the ministers uh, in, in parliament, he actually took uh, days off or leave because he actually had a new child. And that was seen as something just so disruptive and just so uh, out there. Um, and then I just thought about it here in Australia. You don't actually hear about that either very much. So with the husband um, mm. or, or the man actually taking leave uh, for to take care of the, the child. Um, is there something that needs to, I guess, start from leadership? Or is that something that needs to, because I guess one of the arguments that I've heard is that a lot of the men, or a lot of workers who are men, uh, they don't take these leave, this leave because they don't see it from the leadership and they, they mm. then perceive, as, perceive it as actually something that is detrimental to their career. Um, is this something that is actually should be instigated by within or is this something that needs to be publicly spoken about and needs to be changed from the up from the top to bottom or is this from something more about uh, bottom to top mm. grassroots i mean i i know it sounds like a cop answer but i think both because mm. this isn't just an idea of a three-year government um there's sexism because of a you know three-year term this yeah. is in historic the, the patriarchy has been embedded for however long a, a, a ginormous amount of time so this needs as much bottom up support as top down support um but in terms of definitely addressing it from the top down i think the the, the clear the clear first step is gender equality in parliament and i often say you know you can look at the rising number of female politicians and think that we're getting there but look at the number of women in cabinet it has not changed since Kevin Rudd back in 2013. I think it's increased by one person, by one woman. And in fact, if you look at Kevin Rudd versus the current government, the number of women in the higher leadership has actually gone down. It went down to one with Tony Abbott and, and slowly kind of, it's very, very low. Um, so the way that we're valuing women's voices, it's still, it's almost like the workforce. We're seeing women in the entry level politician roles. But in terms of the minister and the prime minister and the roles that really carry gravitas and weight, we're still not valuing the role of women's voices. So I think we absolutely need more gender diversity and representation in parliament. And not only that, I think the way that parliament is structured is that it's women often have to kind of play the game to get to a certain point and kind of adopt even, you know, look at Julie Bishop who didn't refer to herself as a feminist. That, that's a perfect example. So we need women that do identify as feminists and that are celebrated to push forward that thinking. And that, that plays a lot into, I guess, the role of parties in the selection process and how they, they value women's voices. So I think that is the first step. It certainly won't fix everything, but it means we need to rethink what we think about power and leadership and agency and value women's voices in that, in that space. So that's definitely um, the initial step. Leadership is definitely important. Uh, I'm not sure if you've given thought to, I guess, the workplace uh, with women a lot more encouraged to enter STEM industries. Uh, is, is, do you think that there, that is something that is, uh, should be also definitely encouraged, uh, but also for, let's say, for men also um, entering, uh, I guess, industries that are predominantly women-orientated, um, or is that something that 
is just not really spoken enough because there is a, definitely a lot more emphasis on the women entering STEM part, but not so much for men entering, let's say, the arts, because I study arts. And mm. it's, it's, there's not many um, men in the classes um, from my experience or just mm. from, let's say, nursing or just those courses. What, what are your thoughts on that? Yeah, I think that's a really good point because I think that when we talk about feminism, there's, there's absolutely another half of the conversation, which is how can men express and understand their passions? And that feeds into a whole wider thing of that kind of toxic expectations or, or whatever. But there is still a role as much as men to, to kind of think about what resonates with them inside um, and whether that be a female-led industry or a male-led industry. Mm. Um, so, yeah, I think it's, it's, it's thinking about kind of the assumptions we have about certain industries and, and finding, finding ways to challenge that. So I would certainly echo that. And I would imagine, you know, the role of men would be important in, in all various sectors. Um, so, yeah. Though strangely, you know, even within women-led industries, mm. even like nursing, there's still a gender pay gap. I know that's not relevant necessarily to that discussion. No, but it's, that's kind of like, it's just kind of, I don't know, surprising. But going back to what you were saying, no. <laughs> yeah, I, mean, I, think, I think a holistic approach is, is really important as well. Not to forget, um, I guess the messages we're also sending to men, just as important. Mm. Mm. Definitely a lot of uh, discussion to be had, a lot of things to be changed. But uh, I'm glad that we brought some of the issues to light today. Uh, yeah, I, I hope everything goes well on your end um, with the new Columbo plan, uh, Yasmin, and with everything else that's going on for university and your career as well. Um, thank you so much for joining me here today. Um, I really do appreciate your time. Thank you so much.